So hi everyone, I'm Prajane and I'll be your host for today. So uh, before we start, I'll just quickly run through the agenda for this session. So um, firstly, I will go through some of the guidelines that we all have to follow uh, during this session. And then I will introduce Izwan to all of us. And then we'll go into the main session, which is why you're all here today. And then we'll go into the Q&A session, which is where we will address the questions that you submitted during registration. And then we will close by um, sharing about some of our exciting upcoming programs that you can look forward to. All right, so uh, to go through the guidelines, so please be reminded that the guidelines of this session are, um, please stay muted throughout the session and also uh, turn off your videos. And please uh, use the chat box uh, to ask any questions that you have for Izwan, and then we will compile them and ask them during the Q&A session. And lastly, please use respectful language in the chat as well, uh, for this session will be recorded. All right, so uh, welcome to our online webinar, everyone. Five legal tips that you should know before starting a business by Izwan. So Izwan is the founder and managing partner of Izwan and Partners, a technology and startup focused law firm. As a specialist technology and venture lawyer with over a decade of legal experience, in corporate law, Izwan is also a very active legal advisor in, in the Malaysia startup ecosystem. So he actually regularly mentors uh, early stage entrepreneurs and shares his expertise in compliance and fundraising methods. So this webinar is actually a part of um, Ready, Set, Rise, which is a series of online events that aim to inspire Malaysian youth to start small businesses and equipping them with practical tools and mindsets to do so. This event is brought to you by RISE, a Malaysian research and social outreach project that empowers Malaysian youth through entrepreneurship. And RISE is proudly supported by City Foundation. So without further ado, I'll just pass the time on to Izwan. Thank you, Krijane. Thank you again for the kind introduction. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Very happy to be here. My name is Izwan. Um, I'm a corporate lawyer. I'm very happy to be here. Always very excited to meet the young entrepreneurs or everybody that is in this session today. Uh, in the next 30 minutes or so, I'll be sharing some thoughts in terms of uh, some of the uh, experience that I have um, gone through being a corporate lawyer. And I hope that this sharing would give you some ideas, especially practical, uh, guidance and tips so that we will be able to navigate your entrepreneurial journey if you're already starting a business. Uh, these are some of the things for you to look at uh, in terms of how you want to uh, explore um, bringing your business to a different level or if you're just planning to start a company or business anytime soon. Uh, I hope that the uh, tips today will give you some ideas. So obviously, um, they are not just going to be five tips that these are the five tips that you should be following uh, when you run a business. Obviously, different business will require different uh, legal issues or challenges that you need to navigate depending on whether or not your business is regulated. So that's something that uh, 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 I would be happy to hear. Uh, what are your businesses uh, or services that you are involved in? So feel free to drop a note in the chat and also happy to ask your question uh, during the Q&A later. So in the next 30 minutes, uh, I, I hope that you will be able to uh, understand uh, some of the common legal issues when it comes to setting up a business in Malaysia. Uh, we'll be going through the different legal entities, vehicle and structures, uh, and also more importantly, to help you spot uh, legal issues, and why and when you should care about legal issues in terms of when you should go and get a lawyer to, to help you with your uh, compliance method that you may have. Uh, I know one of the uh, participants asked a question as to when to engage a lawyer. And that's something that we hope we can address as, as well during the presentation uh, uh, in a bit. So I don't, wanna, I don't wanna go too much about what we do. Obviously you can look at us up, uh, Izwan Zakaria or my name or Izwan and Partners, uh, we work a lot with early stage companies. We work a lot with technology companies. So we really love uh, speaking to new entrepreneurs. So every week I speak to more than 
seven to ten uh, aspiring entrepreneurs every week. So I'm very excited to be speaking with uh, everybody today and hopefully I can have a chat and say hi and really learn more about what you're trying to do and, and if there's something that we can help, we'll be happy to do so as well. Um, so these are some of the companies that we work with for the past uh, two, three years or so since we've started uh, running, I started uh, setting up my own practice. So previously I was working for other people as well. So now I'm self-employed as my own entrepreneur running a law firm business. So obviously I also have my own personal experiences and also challenges that I had to overcome. So happy to share that with you as well. So we work with every tech, we work with uh, financial technology, we work with accelerators, we work with investors, we work with ecosystem players and, and all other different um, uh, uh, players in the ecosystem. So very happy to be here today. Again, thank you so much, Rice, Kajani, Jawe, and also Candy for having me this uh, evening. Um, something that I just want to quickly uh, shameless plug to, to, to just put it out there is that I've, we recently started a, a legal blog. Uh, so feel free to subscribe uh, uh, to our newsletter. All the contents are free. So if you have a question that you want to ask or you can't uh, figure out how to deal with certain things, just drop us a note in the contact form. We'll be happy to answer that in our blog sec uh, in our future uh, blog post. So just a, little bit, a little, just a little bit about me. I've been a lawyer for the last 10 years, like what Kijani mentioned. Uh, um, again, happy to be here. I'm, always a, I'm also a mentor at several uh, accelerators like Selangor Accelerator Program, Founder Institute, and also in um, Singapore as part of the Social Enterprise uh, Center. So happy to have a chat in terms of anything that could help you, not perhaps just a legal side or maybe anyone that you think I can connect you with. Uh, I mean, that's something that we also do as well. So let's get started. I don't know, know whether you're feeling a bit, uh, I know with all this pandemic going on and you may be running your business already or you may just have an idea that you want to do something and when you sit down and start doing your research, you realize that there's so many things that you need to do. Uh, and I, I really don't have that intention to add up to more of that confusion or the kind of uh, overwhelming feeling that you may have right now. So please don't feel that this presentation is more like a, 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 a way to add up to more stress, so look at it more of a guidance or more of like a, a things for you to take note. So obviously um, these are important things and you should do it progressively it's not something that uh, you need to do it immediately in the sense that all this thing needs to be done now so obviously uh, all the legal and compliant things are important but the more important thing as well is also to look at uh, what are the most uh, immediate steps in terms of running a business and getting the structure right so that's something that i hope i will be able to share uh, during the next uh, 20 30 minutes or so so very quickly, the first point that I want to highlight is to about setting up a, a business entity. And I think a lot of people struggle a lot with this. Uh, in Malaysia, for example, we have different type of legal structures. Uh, we don't have time to go through in detail, but uh, generally there are three, four uh, usual legal structures or legal entities. The first one that is most popular that we all know is called an enterprise or a sole proprietor. You can just go to Companies Commission of Malaysia, which is the regulatory body that is in charge on setting up new businesses. It costs like 60 ringgit to set it up for one year. Once you get that uh, certificate, you can go to the bank and open a trading account, or open an account to say that, um, to use the business name that you set up, uh, depending on whether or not the name that you've chosen is still available because there's so many businesses being set up. So your business name, may not necessarily be the same as the brand that you may want to use, uh, but that's fine. You can still use a different name or different website name or domain name, although your company may be different. Uh, the most popular option, obviously, is, is uh, obviously is the number high. I think the biggest question that, that a lot of people ask is, when exactly uh, should you start a company uh, for your business. So obviously, uh, it's a very big question. Obviously, you need to spend money and it costs a bit to sell a company. 
um, nowadays it can it can cost between depending on which company secretary that you choose to work with it can be as little as uh, 2000 ringgit and it can be as as high as 3000 ringgit to set up a company but that seems to be the average cost that you need to pay to set up a company in malaysia so the answer to that question is yes you should set up a company if you're really serious about doing your current venture as a business so if you're running an fmb uh, you started selling uh, to your friends and family and they really like what you're doing i mean that's just like a lot of how businesses started i'm sure we all know secret recipe uh, the rumors or at least the popular history is that secret recipe started in a small kitchen and when they became big they started expanding and so on so that's something that you should also be thinking as well so obviously setting up a company is something that you should consider uh, uh, not as a matter of, 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 of the important. Uh, so it is also possible for you to start as an enterprise, uh, which is very cheap to set up, which is 60 ringgit. You can start doing that with the next one or two years, depending on how your business grows. Once your business starts growing, and that's where you should consider setting up a company, which is a private limited company or known as a number high. Um, so if you're already operating as a sole proprietor, as, a, as an enterprise or limited liability partnership, you should really consider setting up a company uh, as soon as you have somebody as an investor that wants to put in money in your business, or you have someone who wants to come on board as a co-founder or as a shareholder or as a partner, because um, that's when you want to have a company so that you can properly issue the shares and the ownership to that person that, that you are bringing into the business. Um, also, obviously, it doesn't uh, ultimately irrespective of whether or not uh, you're using a number hard or you're using an enterprise you need to make sure that all the filings are done and up to date it's meaning to say that every year if it's an enterprise for example you need to make sure that all the necessary filings are done to the company's commission because you need to do the the lodgement with the company's commission to make sure that everything is properly done uh, if you're in a running enterprise so recently uh, the government announced that uh, those those small medium enterprises that are earning below uh, a certain threshold of 500,000 ringgit, if I'm not wrong, get 3,000 ringgit grant. So I know a lot of people uh, were unable to receive the grant simply because they failed to register their company or second, they forgot or they just neglected the renewal of their business license. So obviously, if they failed to do that, they no longer qualify uh, to receive the grant. So this is something that you should also take note uh, once you decide to set up a, a business entity, whether or not it's an enterprise, whether or not it's a company, um, you need to make sure that uh, you follow the uh, statutory requirements when you need to do the filing and so on. So obviously the point I'm trying to make, and the first tip is obviously don't delay the incorporation for too long. If your business is generating income, you're making some money and you really, serious about leaving your current job to do this full time uh, that's when you decide to set a company uh, as soon as possible and i think one more important thing that i'm sure a lot of people of you may already know is obviously if you have a company uh, when you sign an agreement or when you sign a contract to do certain things the liability or the responsibility for the contract is with the company so in other words if something goes wrong if your customer, if your vendor, if your partner is not happy, they might sue the company. Your personal uh, uh, liability will not be affected in the sense that uh, if you agree to deliver 100,000 ringgit worth of product or services, uh, if the company fails to deliver, the customer will not be able to go uh, against your personal asset, your, your car, your savings, your house and so on. So that's something that uh, to take note uh, why a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners set up a private company uh, in the first place as opposed to setting up an enterprise um, uh, as a substitute. Um, so these are some of the quick tips. Uh, choosing a legal entity, I mentioned to you already earlier um, about failing to appropriately limit possibility as to why a lot of people use a sole proprietor and not business entity. Again, uh, very quickly, happy to share the slides. So you guys don't need to worry about writing all these things down. Um, I'll share the slide with the Rice team later so you can go through this after this. 
uh, during your leisure time so that you can run through this. Um, I know a lot of people want to save money. They also want to set up instead of a company, they went and set up a limited liability partnership because it's cheaper. I really do not encourage you to do so because it's not really a, 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 a good structure or entity for you to set up in the long run unless you really have no plan to get money from investor, for example, uh, unless you're planning to do it as a small uh, outfit. Um, so that's something to take note. Um, another thing that I also realize a lot of people are asking is whether or not they want to sell a company outside Malaysia, whether or not they want they should sell a company in Singapore. Uh, again, really, you should sit down and understand the differences and what are the down of the road pitfalls if you want to sell a company in Indonesia, in Vietnam, in Singapore. We need to speak to the local uh, lawyers, local scrapers, so that you know understand what are the differences. So usually, every country that you go to, you will have a legal entity. Uh, it's most likely as member high. So same thing earlier, like what I mentioned, you need to make sure that all the necessary records are in place, which is why it's important to choose a good company secretary, somebody that understands your business as well, uh, that could help you uh, avoid the pitfalls along the way. Um, second thing, um, also, I know this may not be a legal, legal advice per se, but I think uh, this is something that I realized over the last 10 years being a corporate lawyer, one thing that differentiates between a, a seasoned entrepreneur or someone that has been in, a, in entrepreneurship or business for a longer period of time compared to someone that has just uh, left or starting a business for the first time is that a lot of seasoned entrepreneurs I know, they have a good team of advisors and mentors that are helping them with their business. So what I meant by advisors and mentors are people like uh, uh, who, are, who are older than you. And obviously, I'm not talking about this guy. I'm sure you, if you've been watching Netflix, I'm sure you'll be watching uh, Breaking Bad. So this is a sequel of, of Breaking Bad called Better Call Saul. So I'm, I'm saying you need to have a good lawyer that is helping you to give you quick legal advice. If you want to sign a contract, you've got someone that you can ask quick advice whether or not um, this, this contract is 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 is... Is, is practical and so on. Uh, if you have accountant that helps you to understand how you want to sort out your accounts and you also have a good company secretary to make sure that all the necessary filings are done correctly. So spend some time to get help um, because the company secretary, uh, legal counsel and accountant, they play a crucial role in ensuring that the business the fundraising process runs smoothly. So every time that you're planning to raise money, you want to do a crowdfunding, for example, you need all these people to come together and help you in ensuring that the process runs smoothly. Um, so these are some of the quick tips. Uh, don't be afraid to ask for a referral. I'm sure Tiljani and Jawe and uh, Candice from RISE will also have some potential mentors that they can link you up. Uh, you can get referrals from accelerators. You can go to Magic. Uh, website, they have a list of mentors that you can reach out to and you can go to LinkedIn, just uh, don't be afraid and don't be embarrassed to ask for help because obviously if you want to become an entrepreneur, you cannot be shy and embarrassed, you cannot be timid, you need to be um, uh, brave to go out and, and face that rejection. And obviously, if you ask for 10 people to become a mentor, maybe you get three or four replies, but still out of that three or four replies, you can get one person that could really help you avoid uh, expensive uh, mistakes and that's something that I think very crucially important that you should take note. Uh, I won't go through much details about the tips but just take note that uh, when you're choosing a company secretary or you're choosing a lawyer you should ask yourself like what is the experience that this person has in advising early stage company or the business that you are running if you're in FNB you want to find an entrepreneur who has been in the FNB space that can help you avoid uh, mistakes that he has made uh, as a young uh, entrepreneur, for example. And obviously, you should be asking yourself, do I like this person as a per as, do I like this lawyer as a person? Do I like this mentor as a person? Because obviously, you want to work with someone that 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 you like. You don't want to work with someone that 
that will make your life miserable and so on. And that's why you decided to start a business in the first place because you want more freedom and autonomy to work with people that will also help you grow as you progress in your entrepreneurial journey. Um, number three, this is a very basic advice, I know, but I cannot emphasize the importance of getting things in writing. And that is something that I also realize as a corporate lawyer, um, I don't go to the court, but I know a lot of my friends who are litigation lawyers or dispute resolution lawyers, people that go to the court, they always say that the difference between a winner or a loser in a litigation or in a court trial is always been the party that has most documents or most things written down in, 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 in writing. So what I mean by that is that obviously contract is one of the things that, that comes to play, but it doesn't have necessarily have to be contracts all the time. It can be an email as well. So every time you met a potential client, you met a customer, or you met anyone for that matter, you can just go back home or you go back to your office and you can just send an email to that person that you just met. Um, hey, um, whoever that person that you met, uh, thank you for the meeting that we had today in KLCC or whatever. Uh, to recap or to summarize our meeting, we have agreed on the following uh, one, two, three, four, um, so it can be as simple as an email. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a, a contract, even if uh, obviously if you have it in a contract, it will be the best way to do that. But not everything uh, can be done in a contract, depending on how, uh, how serious or formal the relationship is. But what I'm trying to say is that you should try as much as possible to keep things in writing. So when things go wrong, um, what the judge will do is not to... Uh, the, what the judge will do is obviously because the judge wasn't around when you went to see the client or when you went to see the customer uh, for the first time. So all the judge will have to rely on is based on whatever emails that you send, whatever WhatsApp messages that you send, whatever uh, letters that you've sent and so on. So these are the important things that you should take note when you're starting a business. I know it sounds like you don't, uh, you are not, you don't being the other person is being untrustworthy, but what you're trying to do is just to put things in record so that if there's anything, um, misunderstanding and so on, you can always come back in the next three to six months and this is what we agreed uh, before this and so on. So obviously, if there's a contract that you need to sign, please read the contract before you sign them. And please know that there is no such thing as a standard contract. Every contract will have different clauses and different things that... Um, you need to read carefully and this is where it's good to have a lawyer that you can trust and help you go through the contract before you sign them to make sure that all the clauses are, uh, are commercial in nature and there's nothing unusual or hidden clauses as I like to say it. So if you have an employee, if you have a, uh, uh, someone that is helping you, make sure that you train them and, and and how to handle customer complaints. And obviously, we all know now how things go viral so easy nowadays on social media, especially even how your uh, face, Facebook messages, responses, and so on. So this is something that you really need to spend some time to learn how to get better PR and responses and so on. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is that uh, seek help early. Don't wait for too long for the problem to happen. And, and get a lawyer to, to help you with the uh, challenge that you may have a even contract that you're planning to sign. Um, so very quickly, um, why you should have things in writing? Uh, obviously, I mentioned to you about contracts. Uh, obviously, they are not the ultimate protection, but at least having a contract can and will help protect you from a lot of the potential negative consequences. Contracts will also provide you with the proof that you sign or agree certain things. If the other if the other customer agrees to pay you this much amount of money, if you do these certain things and you've done the thing and the other customer fails to do so, you can go to the court and get the court to make sure that you get paid and so on. If you don't have it in writing, obviously uh, it will be more challenging for you to prove your case and so on. Um, so you want to avoid any dispute uh, or becoming uh, this is what he said, this is what I said, and 
obviously you're just bound to cause more uh, confusion and conflict it will make it very difficult for the judge to also make a decision as to the outcome of the case uh, so obviously we want to reduce what we call a selective amnesia where you don't remember this but you don't remember other things uh, that's why you have to put things in writing so next thing i want to have a chat is about funding your business uh, we won't go too much details but just to get a quick uh, 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 thoughts in terms of uh, fundraising because it's something that also very important uh, obviously when you're starting your business for the first time you'll probably be using your own personal saving or what people say bootstrapping but after a while once you want to progress your business to a different level you may want to consider uh, getting funding for your business so obviously when it comes to funding you have three options one is obviously getting a government grant but nowadays, obviously, getting a grant is also becoming more challenging because there's so many people applying for the same amount of grant. And the amount of grant may also be limited. So that leaves you with two options. You have um, equity, which is selling shares in the company to an investor, uh, which is obviously the most common structure. And you also have debt, which is a loan. You can actually borrow money. You can go to the bank and borrow money uh, or an investor. But obviously, borrowing money from the bank, if you are an early stage company, it's going to be very challenging. So that leaves you usually with the first option by selling equity in your business. Um, so this is just something for you to take note. Uh, once you decide to do this, it's good to get a lawyer to help you uh, so that you can understand what are the things to look at in terms of how much percentage that you should be giving away and what kind of paperwork or document that you need to sign. Uh, uh, to get the money into the bank account. So obviously, when I say getting the money into the bank account, I'm not talking about your personal bank account. It should be the company's bank account because the company is the one that is receiving the money for the uh, operation. And so that uh, once the money is in, how do you ensure that the investor gets the shares in the company and so on? And that's where the company's capital will need to prepare the uh, resolution to issue the shares and so on. Um, what I want to highlight is that when it comes to making money is to also be creative. Obviously, I mentioned to you earlier that as a business, you can uh, raise money from investor by uh, selling shares or equity in your business, which is a percentage of your ownership of the business. Or second is by borrowing money from the bank. But another way to look at it is actually things like crowdfunding, for example. I'm sure we all know what a Kickstarter is. In Malaysia, there are several platforms and I'm sure we all know what is Oxwhite on the right side here. So where, the way how Oxwhite worked, obviously, previously when it started out, you can actually pre-order and you only get your shirt in the next one month or two months, but people love the idea so much that they're willing to pay. So this is something that you should also consider without giving away your percentage of equity in the business. You can actually get money by pre-selling or pre-order or bulk order for the customers. So this is something that I also realized is something that a lot of people are doing and there's no uh, 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 there's no other, there, there are different ways on how it can be done, but this is one common way uh, in terms of how you can uh, raise money for your business so that you can get the working capital or the initial funding for you to get your business started. So obviously, once you get the money, you need to make sure that you deliver on your promises as well. Um, the last one before we end and answer your Q&A, happy to answer uh, any question that you may have about your particular business journey at the moment is the, the last point on intellectual property. Uh, again, I won't dive into detail, but just to quickly run through uh, the important aspect of, of intellectual property assets. Uh, they are important uh, aspect of a business, especially if you are a technology business because uh, what else is more important than your intangible asset? It could be your online website, it could be e-commerce website, it could be an app, for example. So obviously, when it comes to IP asset, you need to know and understand what are the different intellectual property assets that can be protected. So you have pattern, which is, I'm sure we all know what this is. It's an iPhone. You've got a pattern here, which is the camera that the Apple has developed. And you have trademark, which is the Apple logo and the iPhone wording that is also uh, protected under the law. You also have this thing called industrial design, 
which is the way how when you hold the iPhone, the design that was made by the, the design team of, of Apple. And finally, you also have copyright. The image that you're looking at, the, the, the application, the, the content, the wordings, everything in the software that is used to build the iPhone are form of copyright. So if you have a website, all the contents, all the um, uh, images, all the photos that you took, they are all copyrighted and protected under the law. So this is something that uh, I just wanted to highlight out there so that you know and understand the differences. Again, happy to share the slides with everybody and so that you can run through and go through. Uh, we won't go through the details, but these are some of the quick checklists in terms of what are the things to look at when it comes to protecting your intellectual property. Uh, remember I mentioned to you earlier that they are all important things, but I just wanted to share that uh, obviously these are all important, but they're not the most urgent thing in the sense that um, uh, if you want to sit down and really do all the intellectual property uh, protection, uh, filings, trademark, and all those other things, it can actually be very expensive, especially if you want to do it in Malaysia, in other country as well, because every country that you go to, you need to do the separate trademark filing and so on. Uh, I really don't encourage you to spend so much money on your trademark filing uh, the first three to six months. Once you, your business starts generating money, and that's where you should start consider hiring a trademark agent to help you with the filing. Uh, so these are some of the quick checklists to think about uh, when you want to protect your IP. Uh, again, happy to answer specific question that you have um, uh, shortly if you have any question that you have on IP. Uh, what next is also important to note is obviously um, uh, how you want to manage your, your intellectual property asset. So again, these are all important things. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have a lot of time to cover them, but uh, just to take note uh, that these are all the IP component that you should be looking at uh, in terms of do you actually own the IP, uh, whether or not the IP is coming from other people, especially if you are building a mobile app uh, for your uh, website and so on. If you engage a website developer or app developer, then obviously you want to make sure that the ownership of the source code or the app belongs to you or the company that you have set up, uh, which is how you want to protect your IP asset. And the last one, obviously, how do you make money from the IP that you have developed? Uh, if you have no proof that you own the IP, then obviously you have problem, uh, which is why it is important to make sure that everybody that is involved in the business, especially if you're a technology company, to sign an NDA, to make sure that all the uh, uh, asset that you everybody that contributes to the business will assign their ownership of their work to the company uh, that is involved in the business that you are in. So I'm done with them. point number five. I'm just going to do a quick recap before we end. Um, what are the things that, that we mentioned earlier? Just a quick uh, practical tips. Uh, I know everybody here is going through different stage of business growth, but these are just some of the things for you to take note. Once you reach this particular point, perhaps, for example, I mentioned to you earlier that anyone that contributes to the company needs to sign confidentiality and assignment agreement so that you make sure that the person that is involved, whether it's an intern, whether it's a freelancer, whether it's a consultant, whether it's a mentor, uh, whether it's an advisor, they need to sign this document called NDA or assignment to make sure that all the customer's data or the, uh, the business model or the trade secret that you're sharing will not be disclosed to any third party without your authorization. And number two, if you decide to hire an employee, whether or not it's a part-time or full-time, you need to make sure that you pay the necessary uh, statutory obligations like EPF, uh, employee provident fund, social security, and also income tax if the uh, monthly salary exceeds the threshold. Uh, but obviously, if you are hiring an intern or freelancer, that may not be the case, but which is why it's important to have things in writing. You can have a simple one or two, three pages of, of engagement letter just so that uh, everybody is clear whether or not it's an employment or, or a simple uh, uh, freelance contract. And obviously, uh, the next point is if you use a template agreement, I know a lot of you want to save money on legal costs 
you will just Google for a simple NDA and so on. Uh, make sure that the template complies with Malaysian laws. Uh, I remember going through a contract several months ago. Uh, it was signed by two parties, which are Malaysian companies. And when you go down further, it says that this contract shall be governed by New York laws. So all I can say is that uh, none of the two parties actually read the contract, which is quite sad to take note, but uh, please read the contract before you sign it. And obviously, if you're using a template, make sure that it complies with Malaysian laws. And obviously, it will be a good idea to get a lawyer to review the agreement so that it is a watertight um, and also get uh, legal advice as soon as you can before you decide to raise money for your business, for example. Um, so in summary, uh, why all these things are important is obviously the fine or the cost or penalty of, of, of not complying with this would be more than doing it right. So obviously it costs a bit of money if you want to hire a lawyer or hire a company secretary or hire an accountant to do your filing. Uh, but if you get fined or penalized, it will actually be a lot more. So obviously you may even lose your company if you fail to comply with the statutory obligation. And I think more reason why it's important to take note of all the legal issues is that most of the time in our experience is that a lot of the issues tend to be discussed or discovered during important times of your business journey. For example, somebody wants to acquire your business, somebody wants to invest in your business, they will want to do a due diligence, which is to do an audit. And that's where they found out that all these things are not properly done. And obviously, the more issues you have, the more business leverage that you're giving away, which also means that somebody has agreed to uh, invest in your company or somebody has agreed to buy your company, they may not want to do so or they may want to buy your company at a cheaper discount because of the legal issues that, that you may have. Uh, and that's something that you need to consider carefully uh, when you're running a business. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Happy to answer any specific question that you have. All right. Thank you so much, Izwan, for sharing with us uh, this really uh, insightful legal advice. Uh, so now we'll move on to the Q&A session. Uh, so the first question that we have for you, Izwan, is um, so someone is asking, is anything else specifically required when applying for a license to sell food and beverage as compared to non-FMB, for example, vaccinations and so on? Yeah, so the question is about uh, running an F&B uh, business. So um, obviously, I work a lot more with uh, technology companies, but generally speaking, uh, there is a usual food handling permit that the F&B operator needs to obtain. So depending on whether or not you're even operating from your house or whether you're operating in a shop, uh, there is a requirement that you need to get the vaccination and so on. So obviously, even if you're operating from your house, which a lot of people are doing nowadays, it may make it may be the best scenario. It may make most sense for you to get the necessary uh, vaccination and all the usual things that is required under the law, simply because you want to make sure that the food that you are selling from a food safety perspective or food hygiene perspective follows the Ministry of Health guidelines. To answer your question, obviously, uh, since you're dealing with food, um, you want to make sure that the customers are, 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 are having the comfort that you have all the necessary licenses. So, um, so I won't go through much details about the licenses, but obviously the answer to that question is yes, you need to get the appropriate licenses to operate the business. I know, I know there are one or two uh, I mean, you may be one person running the whole uh, kitchen right now. Uh, obviously, if you're doing a one or two person, that's fine. But if you're doing it on a commercial level, if you're selling to 100 people a day or commercial scale, you're doing catering and all those other things, that's where you need to start looking at it more seriously. Um, so that's something that I would really encourage you to take a look at. Great. Yeah, so... Um... This other question is also related to FMB. Um, so this person is asking, is there a government body we should go to to get the nutrition of the FMB product checked for the label? 
Yeah, I have no idea what is that government agency is called, but I suspect that it should also be under the uh, Ministry of Health uh, purview. Um, so the Ministry of Health have different departments that looks at the nutritional compounds of a particular food product. So depending whether or not you're selling uh, snacks, biscuits, or, or whether it's perishable, non-perishable, assuming that you're selling packaged food, then obviously that product may need to be sanctioned by, by the Ministry of Health, depending on whether or not you have you are claiming that the product has some medicinal properties. Again, we won't go through the details about the specifics, but my suggestion to you is to give a call to the Ministry of Health and really check with them in terms of what are the things that you should be looking at. Because obviously, uh, I know it can be quite challenging to comply with the regulation because, for example, some of the requirements can be quite uh, difficult to comply like if you are selling supplement one of the requirements that the ministry imposes is for you to have a factory so it doesn't make sense for you to go and sell a factory unless you are selling for uh, a, a commercial scale like, you know, like thousand of customers that you're selling it to so so that's something that you also need to consider again happy to have a separate chat uh, I'll, I'll drop you my contact email and you can just send me a note and happy to take a look at what is a specific fruit product that you are selling and whether or not um, you need a specific license for that. So obviously, generally speaking, if it's a food product, if it's a supplement, it's for medicinal purposes, there needs to be some uh, approval or certification from the um, Ministry of Health, especially if you want to advertise uh, the food product, it needs to follow a certain advertising guideline. So that's something that you need to take a look at. Uh, if, if it's related to medicinal, supplement, um, and so on. Uh, but again, I may not be answering your question directly because I don't have visibility as to your food product. So uh, please, whoever that asks that question, uh, drop me a note and happy to have a chat with you. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, for your information, everyone, we will be uh, sending you uh, Iswan's email as well and also the slides after this session so you can get in contact with him. Um, okay, moving on to the next question. Um, so someone is asking, do we need to own a business account when starting a business? Yeah, so this is also coming back to the first question that we um, were addressing earlier. Um, it is not really a requirement that you need to have a business account, but um, if you are really serious about doing something as a business, then the answer is obviously yes. But nowadays, it costs so little to sell a business. Uh, it's, I mean, if you are setting up a sole proprietor or enterprise, it's 60 ringgit. You can go to the company's permission. And last week, the government also announced to encourage more uh, entrepreneurship. The government is actually waiving the fee, so you don't actually need to pay to sell a company uh, as an, uh, a, an enterprise and a sole proprietor. So you can get a you can get the business set up and then open the bank account so you can have ABC trading uh, something or ABC ventures or something you can think of a name uh, and then you have a registration number so that also gives you a bit more visibility uh, obviously uh, even if you want to run your business on your own without setting up a business account uh, you can do so as well it's just that uh, it'd be a bit more challenging in terms of separating and segregating your business account and your personal account because uh, if you have a company, obviously you need to file the account separately. But if you are operating as a sole proprietor or enterprise, you need to uh, uh, file it individually. So, but it's good to get that discipline going on so that you don't you don't mix your personal bank account and your business bank account which is why I would still encourage you to consider setting up a business account just to get that discipline going on. Um, once mm -hmm. you're ready, you can always upgrade next three to six or nine months as the business progresses, set up a company and you can have a, a, a proper Sendam Brahat set up. Mm. All right. Thanks for that. Uh, the next question is from Jade. Um, so I want to ask if we build app and add it to the Google Play Store, do we need to register anything? I think you need to go and check uh, with the Google app and the Play Store and App Store. I think there is an agreement that you need to fill. 
Uh, I know a lot of people who just publish the app on their own, but I think there is a requirement that you need to include the company, if I'm not wrong. Uh, or is it possible for you to use a personal name? Uh, to answer your question, Jada, uh, there is no requirement for you to register anything uh, in Malaysia, but on the App Store and the Play Store, there is a requirement for you to fill up the form in the Google Play Store and also the Apple's App Store. So this is something that you need to go through. Uh, I don't remember the form. I, I think they have changed the form slightly a bit. Um, um, so you need to decide whether or not you want to submit the app under your personal name or you want to submit the app under a company name. Um, so there, there should be that option there. Uh, but I think most of the time, a lot of people will submit under the business name. So which is where maybe you want to set up a company so that you can have a company name that shows up when people look for your app. Okay, thanks for that. Um, moving on to the next question from Joe. How about as a content creator with a studio, if we just earn money via YouTube or other social media platforms? Yeah, hi Joe. So obviously, if you are a content creator, you'll be creating a lot of assets. Uh, digital assets in terms of videos, in terms of songs, in terms of contents or different type of contents. It can be shorter contents, uh, long form and so on. Uh, so these are all your intellectual property. So under the intellectual property branches, it falls under copyright or known as literary work. So literary work includes, uh, includes novels, includes source code, includes uh, contents in terms of videos, musics, and so on. So um, if you are a content creator, uh, obviously, depending on how much money you're making at the moment, you may want to set up a company because obviously, when you set up a company, you have a lot more uh, flexibility in terms of uh, managing your income tax as well. Because at the moment, if you are receiving income, from YouTube and other social media platforms like TikTok or other platforms, you need to make income tax declaration depending on how much you make. So obviously, if you're earning an income, if you're declaring your income as an individual, your income tax threshold will be a lot more higher compared to what you would be able to uh, uh, save if you were running a company, for example. But more importantly, uh, having a company to own the contents will also be more uh, appropriate in the sense that it will also allow you to do licensing for example i don't know in the next six months or nine months um, you have another studio that really like what you're doing and they want to take uh, some of the work that you have done and they want to um, make something new or make something out of it uh, you can actually either sell that or you can also license it to them at a royalty or fee payment, uh, which is where uh, having a company sounds like a more, uh, it's a more formal way to do it, it's a more professional way to do it, but also at the same time, uh, helps you to save a bit money, a lot of money in income tax, uh, also at the same time, also helps you to structure uh, your accounting, because currently right now, all the money will probably go into your personal bank account, and you may want to have a separate bank account so that you know there's no commingling uh, i hope i answered your question joe i don't know whether that's specifically uh, what you wanted to ask so again uh, happy to have a separate chat just drop me a note and we can have a chat on that uh, i think jasmine asked a question whether or not uh, you need a lawyer to make a contract um, the, the quick answer to your question is yes jasmine you should get a lawyer to drop your contract um, it's just that depending on how complicated the contract would be uh, if it's just a simple contract, an NDA or an employment contract, you can get the lawyer to do it once and you can use that next round every time you do the same contract. But you should always get a lawyer to, to take a look at it to make sure that the contract is, 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 is consistent with what you want to do. But also at the same time, uh, having a good corporate lawyer will also be able to, to pinpoint what are some commercial issues that you may not have thought about. Uh, and one thing I want to share very quickly that I didn't manage to share just now is that 
Uh, a lot of people don't realize that in Malaysia, for example, uh, you can actually arrange a call with a lawyer. And most of the time, lawyers in Malaysia don't charge for uh, initial consultation meeting. So you can go and speak to three law firms, five lawyers, and obviously you should call and check. Do uh, you charge for initial consultation meeting? And I think most of the time, the answer is no, they don't charge for consultation meeting. Uh, so most of the time when you ask the question during that meeting, you probably get your answer already. I'm not trying to say that uh, you should just rely on that free advice, but um, most of the law firms now have startup friendly package as well. Uh, they also want uh, a lot of lawyers now also do CSR, they also do mentoring. So you should always, uh, don't be afraid to ask a lawyer for advice. A lot of people, uh, if they know you're just starting out and you may not have money to pay them, if the request is not so complicated or something that is not too complex, they'll probably just help you out. So don't be afraid to ask for help. I think a lot of lawyers uh, are very uh, friendly people and don't be afraid to, to, to say hi and, and see whether they can help you or whoever that might be and, and so on. Uh, Joe asked a question again, uh, how about recruiting new people? What are the kind of stuff you need to take concern? Um, hi, uh, yeah, Joe, so if you want to hire someone, you need to decide whether or not you want to hire them as an employee or whether you want to hire them as a, as a freelancer. So what I meant by employee, obviously, is if you hire someone as an employee, whether it's part-time or full-time, Every month, you need to make sure that you pay the salary inclusive of the statutory uh, contribution as an employer. So that means EPF, SOPSO, uh, EIS, uh, LHDN, all those other things. So, so another option is instead of recruiting the people as an employee, you can also recruit them as a, as a freelancer. What I, meant by, what I mean by freelancer is like uh, uh, independent consultant or contractor. So under the law, there's this distinction between an employment and independent contractor. So what I meant by independent contractor would be like, I mean, everybody knows like the Grab food rider, the food panda rider, the Grab driver, they are all actually independent contractor. They are not employees of food panda or employees of Grab. They only make what they make if they switch on the app and they go out and send the food or they go and pick up people. So that's something else that you can also consider doing. Uh, but obviously, you need to look at carefully in terms of uh, what are the uh, expectation, uh, what are the job description, what are the, uh, what are the uh, exit clause. Obviously, if you're hiring someone as an employee, um, how long is the probation, how long is the termination notice, and so on. So obviously, there's a long list of, of things that you need to consider. But more importantly, it's just to keep in mind in terms of uh, whether or not you're hiring them for part-time, full-time as an employee, or if it's not an employee, then if it's a short-term, or if you just need a website done, uh, you need a website designer, you need to hire them for that. If you hire someone for sales, then you may pay them based on the commission. So that's something that you can also take note. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, Joe asked another question. I know Joe, Joe likes to ask a question. Just drop me a note, uh, drop me an email. Joe, happy to have a chat with you. Um, so, so, yeah, you wanted to know if it's necessary to hire a lawyer um, for equity contract. Yes, obviously, I may be biased for saying this because I'm a lawyer myself, but you should get a lawyer to help you draft the agreement. Uh, so, nine out of ten time or ten out of ten time, if an investor wants to invest in your business, uh, the investor will be the one that gives you the uh, offer. That offer is known uh, as an investment term sheet. Uh, but sometimes, or if you're dealing with angel investor or family and friends, then um, you may be the one that needs to come up with the documentation. So that's where the lawyer uh, would be important to help you draft the document. But even if the document is prepared by the investor's lawyer, you should still have your own lawyer because just remember that the investor's lawyer is not representing your interest. He's actually representing the investor's interest. So what you may want, uh, you wouldn't know because uh, unless you have done fundraising before, you have received money for your equity investment, uh, then you would know what is 
the standard clause and what it may be something unusual. So I like to say these are all hidden clauses or things that you may not know. So I do I know uh, a lot of people get excited when I know it's very convenient to, for me to say this because you are the entrepreneur in the end of the day. Um, an investor decides to invest uh, 200,000 ringgit or 500,000 ringgit in your company and they ask you to sign the document, you probably be very excited that you're going to get the money and you just sign the agreement. And what you don't realize is that the agreement may have certain clauses that would um, give the investor a certain rights or, or powers over the business. Or for example, the investor now becomes a director in your company. So if you want to do certain things, you need to get the investor to give their green light. So these are the things that that you should spend some time to, to take a look. Um, so having a good lawyer will be able to help you avoid uh, some of these things. Uh, I know I, I have, have dread, I've dealt with several scenarios where um, the founder or entrepreneurs have signed the agreement and only then they came to see us and want us to help them. Uh, obviously, you can go back to the investor and ask for the contracts to be renegotiated, but you should go and get a lawyer to be involved as early as possible so that you can uh, go through all the clauses so that you'll be comfortable. And the point I'm trying to make is that uh, so long as you know what you're signing and you know the consequences of the terms and condition, um, and that's why it's important. Um, so uh, it doesn't cost that much to hire a lawyer. I don't think lawyers' fees are expensive compared to other people. I know UI, UX designers are getting paid a lot more than lawyers in terms of certain work. I know a lot more technology developers. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, I'm not saying that we are cheap as well, but we're not so expensive as well. So, so think about that. Uh, again, a lot of lawyers now have a fixed fee. So before you engage them, they will tell you, okay, this is how much my fee will be. Uh, this is how long I think I will need to get the work. So you know how much exactly you're going to pay them when you engage them. So don't be afraid to ask three or four or five different lawyers for their advice and really decide which lawyer that you're most comfortable to deal with and, and, and the lawyer will not only just be a lawyer but also become a trusted business advisor and I really hope that that would um, take out some of your uh, concern or hesitation as to why uh, uh, you should uh, engage a lawyer uh, to help you with your business. I know it's right. a very long answer to this question, <laughs> but uh, it's also very hard to, to ask a lawyer what is important because I think all lawyers will say everything <laughs> is important, but uh, it's not going to be good advice. But what I'm trying to say is that um, uh, um, you should sit down and really map out in terms of what is important. Mm. We try to manage that progressively as your business grows. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Izwan, for answering all of uh, our audience questions. Uh, and as mentioned just now, if uh, you have any more specific questions about uh, your business, the legal aspects of your business, um, I will link uh, Izwan's email um, after this event. And also, uh, so if you have any questions, you can direct it to him. I will also send you guys the slides after this event as well. Um, yes, the email is in the chat box. Thanks, Izan. Um, yeah, so with that, we have come to an end of this uh, webinar. Um, that was Izan, everyone, uh, sharing uh, his uh, legal expertise um, with all of us, um, brought to you by RISE and supported by City Foundation. So I hope this webinar has been uh, really fruitful for a lot of you and has clarified some of the um, questions that you have on how to actually start and run the business um, legally um, to kind of protect yourself and also your business in the long run. So if you're interested to check out um, more about uh, Izwan and Partners, um, so Izwan's law firm, uh, feel free to check out their social media, which is presented on the slides here. So you can go check them out. And um, so next is, uh, if you're interested to learn more about starting a business, uh, Rise Online is a free beginners uh, online course for Malaysians to learn at their own pace about the basics of building a small business. So this course closes uh, in July. It's open now, so you can sign up today and join us and it will close in July. Um, so if you're a Malaysian aged uh, 18 to 28, uh, you will also stand a chance to win uh, 
seed funding up to one uh, 10,000 ringgit at the end of the course, terms and conditions apply. So start today by signing up at bit.ly slash rise online 2021, which is on the link on the slides here. Yep. So if you are interested in finding out more about RISE and what we do at RISE, uh, please check out our social media, which is where we post a lot of updates on a lot of upcoming uh, programs and really exciting events like Ready, Set, RISE that you're here today. So thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Izan, for your time. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to email him and he will very kindly uh, give you some advice as well. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.